Now coming to the other important organ which is involved in the movements that is the cerebellum. There is one cerebellum difference between feature difference between the cerebellum and basal ganglia disorder. In Parkinson, we will see that the Parkinson patient can have a resting tremor. But in a cerebellum, the patient will have tremors when he is trying to do movements. That is called as intentional tremor. So, this is one classical difference between a basal ganglia disease and a cerebellar disorder. We will see what is the reason, why is the reason behind that. So, coming to the cerebellum, it is the largest part in the hindbrain. Previously, the cerebellum was called a silent area of brain. Because whenever the neuroscientists were mapping the brain, they used to stimulate various places and see whether any hand action is there or any other action is there. If no action was thought not there, they were thinking that the part is not involved in motor system. But cerebellum action begins whenever we are trying to do the movement. At rest, it doesn't do anything for the movement. So, cerebellum action is to correct the movements most of us know. And it happens whenever we are trying to do the movement only. So, that's why they refer to a silent area because during stimulation nothing was happening. But it has a very good role in case of motor system. So, coming to the parts of the cerebellum, here we have drawn it in various sections. So, first thing is the for part here is that is the anterior part. Anterior part is there. Then just behind the anterior part that is the posterior part or posterior lobe. Then finally, in the bottom, there is one more lobe called as flocconodular lobe. Flocculonodular lobe. So, these are the divisions of cerebellum anatomically. But physiologically, there is another important division which are called as zones. They are called as zones. They were divided primarily into three different zones. The central portion is called as the vermis. The central portion is called as the vermis. Then immediately next to the vermis, there is one region which is called as intermediate zone. Intermediate zone. Then the green shaded area here, this area is called as the lateral zone. It is called as the lateral zone because it is situated laterally. So these are the three different functional zones. So we are going to discuss our cerebellum with respect to these three different zones. Only. As you can see here, in the vermis region, there is some representation like a homunculus it is represent the central part of the body is represented in the vermis so what will be their action their action will be to stabilize the axial muscles and as you can see here this we have drawn it something like a limbs the limbs are in the intermediate zone so the central zone so the vermis and the intermediate zone has topographical representation not very precise like a motor homunculus or a sensory homunculus but somewhat there they have some localization this worm is on the intermediate zone. Then the lateral zone, when they studied the racial zone, none of the representation of the body was there. Then they thought that it has, it has, but it had multiple connections within itself. So what they understood is, this part is the one which is involved in planning and programming of movements. It is not for a specific muscle group. It is for the entire planning and programming of the movements. So coming to the cerebellum, so these are the zones of the cerebellum. Then finally, we have to understand what are the inputs to the cerebellum and what are the outputs of the cerebellum. Coming to the inputs of the cerebellum, inputs of the cerebellum can happen from the cerebral cortex and from the periphery. So let's try to understand what is the function of the cerebellum. So cerebellum, what it does is, whenever any action is done by the motor cortex, what they do? They will send the impulses to the periphery they will send the impulses to the periphery. At the same time, the motor cortex will send the impulse to the or the blueprint to the cerebellum also. About this peripheral activity, it will send a blueprint to the cerebellum. So, it is like a master who is doing, asking, come, giving command to the periphery to do the work. At the same time, he is appointing a manager. This cerebellum acts like a manager. The manager will receive the blueprint from the cortex and he will keep on looking at the workers. Whenever there is a mismatch between the blueprint and the work done, the cerebellum can correct its own. If it is a minor mistake, the cerebellum correct, can correct its own. If it is a gross mistake, again it has to inform to the motor cortex. So, the cerebellum will receive the blueprint from the motor cortex and it will also receive impulses from the periphery because now then only it can compare. Once it has received from the motor cortex, from the periphery, whatever action is going on, it will compare both of it. So, it has to receive the inputs from both the sides. So, how do they receive their inputs? The cerebellum receives their inputs in various different tracts. The one which is going to the vermis is, is called as reticulocerebellar tract. Reticulocerebellar tract. Then 
one which is going to the floconodular lobe. This floconodular lobe is very, very essential for the balance and hearing. Hearing and ba the balance is very, very essential and it is always associated with the vestibular apparatus of the ear. So, with respect to the head position or the ear position, the balance can be maintained with the help of these tracts. That tract is called vestibular cerebellar tract. And where do they go? They go specifically to the floconodular lobe. And one more tract is there which is called as olivocerebellar tract. This goes to all the regions, lateral zone, intermediate zone as well as the vermis. But the most important tract among all this is the, some, I told you somebody has to bring the blueprint from the cortex to the cerebellum. That job is done by the cortico ponto cerebellar tract. Now it's nothing but from the cortex it is going to the cerebellum via the pontine nucleuses. So that is called as cortico pontine cerebellar tract. So this is the most important tract which is bringing the blueprint from the cortex. And from the periphery, two things I have to know. First thing is, what is the position of all my entire body? Like what is the position of this hand? What is the position of the limbs? What is the position of the back? Everything it has to know. Next thing is, suppose if I am picking up something, so the ongoing movement, whatever movement is ongoing, that also should be sent to the brain. So if, the, if I need any change in, uh, change in action, what the cerebellum can do? It can change the posture also. Suppose I can move forward or go back depending upon the change in action that is required. And this positional will be done by the one track, one group of tracks and another will be done by the next group of tracks. That is giving the efference copy of the ongoing movements. So there are two groups of tracks. One is called as the dorsal spinocerebellum. From the spinal cord, it is going to the cerebellum. Then ventral spinocerebellum. From the ventral side, it is going to the spinocerebellum. From the spinal cord, it is going to the cerebellum. This dorsal spinocerebellum, they will carry the sensation from proprioceptors. So, it will tell us all about the position of the body and everything. Then this ventral spinocerebellar tract, what they do is, they carry the efference copy. Efference copy. This is very, very important because the ongoing movement, the efference copy is carried by the ventral spinocerebellar tract. And this is one of the fastest track in the body. Fastest track in the body. And I'll tell you one interesting thing. It travels at the speed of 120 meter per second. When you convert it into kilometers, it is 432 kilometers per hour. So it is traveling at a very fast rate. Why it should travel at a very fast rate? Because it has to tell the ongoing action immediately to the cerebellum so that it can do the necessary corrections. Now coming to the outputs from cerebellum. Now it is receiving inputs in a similar manner from the cerebellum, some output has to go. The output goes through four deep nuclei in the cerebellum. The four deep nuclei present are dentate nuclei, emboliform nucleus, globus and fastigial. Out of these two, the intermediate two nucleus are grouped together now, which is called as interposed. They are intermediate between the two nucleus, so they are called interposed. So, major nuclei are dentate, interposed and fastigial. The dentate is the most important nuclei. So, now tell me if it is the most important nuclei, from which zone the output should go? Lateral zone, because it is the one which is involved in planning and everything. So from the lateral zone, as you can see here, from the lateral zone, it goes to the dentate nuclei and finally it will go to the thalamus and finally it will reach the cortex and keep on communicating with the cortex about the movement and coordination. So the dentate nucleus is very, very important. Now coming to the vermis, the vermis will give to the fastigial nuclei. The vermis will give to the fastigial nuclei and it is involved in brainstem and reticular formation, it will go. And the most important function is the axial muscle control. And the flocculonodular lobe also is involved in it. And the flocculonodular lobe's most important function is for the cerebellar balance, like along with the vestibular system. Then the intermediate zone, just remember eye for eye, the intermediate zone is the one which is giving impulses to the interpose. And they will go to the thalamus and it will it is involved in reciprocal contraction. For example, Whenever there is an ongoing action going on, the agonist muscle should contract and the antagonist muscle should relax. This is called as reciprocal type of contraction. This is controlled by the interforce muscles. And since it is coming from the intermediate zone, it is controlling most of the distal muscle movements. So these are the major outputs from the cerebellum. So cerebellum's function is to compare the motor cortex and see whether the, uh, to check whether the ongoing action is correct or not. And they have seen that the cerebellum is firing the next movement that is required. The cerebellum is always in an anti anticipation of the next movement also. That much powerful the cerebellum is. So what will happen whenever there is a cerebellar dysfunction? It will lead to dysmetria and ataxia.
what is this materia suppose we are trying to do an action like touching the nose what will happen there will be an overshoot this overshoot when my cerebellum is not fine i'll try to correct it back but again an overshoot will be there so this kind of uh, ongoing for to and fro motion or a pendular kind of motion will be seen in a cerebellar in a patient that is called dysmetria the uncoordination or the non coordination which happens due to dysmetria is called as ataxia ataxia means because of this uncoordination the patient will not be able to walk properly or do the activities properly then what is happening what is pause pointing so if for, suppose just in case if i want to do anything i am trying to point it but there will be an overshoot that is called as pause pointing and whenever the patient is asked to do repeated pronation and supination movements this is called as diadochokinesia but in a cerebellar disorder he will not be able to do at all sometimes it is completely absent it is called as a diadochokinesia then finally the, uh, the dysarthria can happen where the proper vocal movements cannot be there so that slurred speech can be there then intentional tremor i told you intentional tremor is one of the most important differentiating feature between a basal ganglia and case of a cerebellar dysfunction the tremor here happens only when the person tries to do a movement then cerebellar nystagmus the rolling of eyeballs will be there then hypotonia which i explained in the spinal uh, decorticate and decerebrate residual cells then drunken gait the patient will behave as if he is a, like a drunken person it is also called as cerebellar gait so these are the features in a cerebellar dysfunction patient